Hewitt. I'm VP of Sales for EMEA. Um, I'm supported today by Andreas Plete. Um, so, hello, Andreas. Hi, this is Andreas Plete speaking. I'm uh, based in Germany, and I will have the pleasure later to do the, the demonstration uh, of what is Paul, Paul is talking about today. No Thank you, Andreas. Um, right, so uh, with that, we'll, we'll, we'll commence, and um, uh, I'm sure there's still one or two more people to join us, but they will hopefully catch up. So, <clears throat> um, so today's webinar is about um, is on the subject of save up to 40% in time and cost by automating the production of your project specifications and project performance metrics. So before we get into the uh, presentation, I'll uh, just go through an agenda of what we will be covering uh, today. If my uh, mouse is working for me, there's a little bit of a time lag here. Right, so uh, initially I'll give a very uh, brief view of who Visual are, what we do, where, our, where we specialize very much in requirements management. And then we'll talk about the capturing of uh, project uh, stakeholder requirements and producing simple report outputs. Um, so as with all um, um, companies who use requirements tools like Visual Requirements, it's all about building confidence that if you put information into a requirements tool that you can get information, that information you put in out just as easily as you put it in. Um, in, in, in a way that uh, obviously most people do with Microsoft Word, you write something in Word and you know automatically you have the ability to, to print it out. Um, so we'll be going through that. We'll be creating um, value, we'll be showing uh, how we create value by linking requirements between project documents. And this is all about understanding um, you know, the impact of what is touched by one requirement change. Uh, we'll also go into understanding how real-time project requirements fulfillment metrics can be generated out of the database. So when you're populating a requirements database, um, you want to know in real time the progress you're making in terms of fulfilling those requirements. Uh, and I'll cover that um, a little bit more in, in a minute. Um, then we'll go through a demonstration on the uh, automated production of fully formatted project specification documents. Um, and then we'll, uh, at the end, we'll review the business benefits and cost savings of automated document production, uh, rather than it being that, that thing that we will have, uh, do at a certain period or particular milestone. All useful project work effectively comes to an end while we actually contribute to making um, uh, a document for delivery. And then we'll open it up for discussion and questions at the end. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping um, uh, on this. Uh, during the presentation, uh, you will all be, uh, your microphones will be muted. Um, and so you, were, you were, uh, won't be able to talk to us. But if you do have any questions or you have, want to raise any questions during the, um, during the webinar, please send, um, fill out the, uh, the chat or the questions um, uh, panel within your, within your web meeting. And, and uh, Andreas and I will endeavor to answer any questions that you raise at the end of this session. Um, so uh, I will carry on. And then we'll obviously at the end we'll close. So going to the next slide. So a little bit about visual requirements first of all. If my mouse will work for me. There we are. So um, who are Visual Solutions? So Visual Solutions is very much a company with an absolute focus on, on requirements engineering. So we specialize in requirements engineering, typically for systems engineering and complex IT systems. Visual Solutions was founded in 2007 to focus on the delivery of innovative requirements solutions and requirements management tools. Uh, we are the manufacturer and distributor of Visual Requirements. Uh, which is now regarded as a leading requirements solution in the marketplace. Um, our headquarters is in Madrid, in Spain, and we now have a secondary headquarters in, um, in San Francisco in the USA, in California. Uh, we also have offices in the UK, Sweden, and Germany. 
Um, in terms of our actual development practices, uh, the, the development of our requirements management tool is ISO SPY certified. And that's actually to support the um, volume business we do do in Germany, particularly for the automotive sector, where there is a particular demand that uh, development practices should be um, ISO, uh, ISO certified. Um, and then finally, the final reference on that slide to IREB uh, is something that we actively support, completely independent of tools, but we support the International Requirements Engineering Board for the certification of requirements engineers. So we have a a three-day foundation course, uh, which has a, um, a globally recognized certification examination at the end of that. Um, that's the foundation course. There's also a, uh, an advanced course, um, and there's under development, they're also developing an expert course. So, so uh, that's uh, visual. So on to the next slide. Um, no. A bit of a time lag here, but I'm sure it will come in a minute. Oh, right. Oh, so back. Other way. Right. So before we get uh, started and talking about uh, project performance metrics, I'll quickly show you a deal, but which uh, which made me smile when I when I saw it anyway. And I'll let you briefly read that, and then uh, and then I'll carry on. Of course, this won't be relevant to any of you, I'm sure. But, uh. So first, uh, first of all, review the, if you like, the dictionary definition of project performance um, metrics. Um, so matching project performance metrics via re requirements. So project metrics can measure processes, activities, resources, and deliverables within a quality control plan. Um, the centralized management of project requirements, which includes identifying, prioritizing, authorizing, managing, and controlling projects, programs, and other related works to achieve the specific business objectives, or in this case, uh, potentially project objectives. Um, one of the things we need to do in this process is avoid scope creep. This is the gold or platinum plating. Uh, that can occasionally come into project requirements, um, you know, proposing a little bit more than maybe the customer is asking for. And we need to ensure that we don't get scope creep through the requirements management process or but, uh, deviating too far away from what the original stakeholders want to place. And meeting requirements is one of the key success, success factors for project management. The project has to deliver on a range of stakeholder needs from customers, stakeholders, and its employees, the marketing department or the, or the um, business objectives of the business itself. Ultimately, project metrics must focus on performance against customer requirements and value. Um, in project management, performance metrics um, are used to continuously assess the health of the project through the measurement of scope, quality, risks, time, costs, and ultimately actions on that project. Um, and very often, I don't know if you've ever had this uh, experience where, um, have, you know, how often have you been asked to produce that last minute project progress report in time for some critical management meeting? How much project resource and effort is consumed uh, by you and others in producing these final customer specification documents? The production of project management metrics documents and project, and project specifications can and should be an automated byproduct of your project requirement solicitation and development process. So we can see how we can realize the um, cost savings of we estimate based on customer feedback between 20 and 40 percent by maintaining a central repository of your project requirements information to support the automated production of your project documents. And that's really the emphasis of this presentation and webinar today. So moving on, let's look at the keeping our KPIs or key performance indicators stakeholders informed. So understand the primary stakeholders key performance indicators. And that's really important that we, that we talk to the primary stakeholders and we communicate back to them the progress that we're making against the requirements that they contributed. And I'll expand on that a little bit in a minute. 
um, we need to limit the project progress and metrics communications to the stakeholders to their KPIs and to their requirements that they contributed um, so that we're trying to give them feedback on what is happening to their requirements in the project management process. We need to avoid sharing project data which is not relevant to these primary stakeholders. The worst thing you can do is present is this the whole wood for the trees um, the, um, argument. Make sure that you only communicate back to those uh, stakeholders information which is relevant to the requirements that they are interested, which is relevant to the key performance indicators that they are personally measured by. To ensure, um, we need to ensure the active participation and commitment of the primary stakeholders. It is important to only share data which is relevant to their objectives and KPI measures. Failure to filter out irrelevant information threatens stakeholder support and commitment to the project and therefore potentially a successful conclusion to that project. Ensure that the language and the data is tailored to the perspective of each stakeholder in context of their given interest. So if you're feeding information back to the finance people within your organization, make sure that the information you're feeding back against their requirements is relevant to the financial aspects of the project. And likewise, you know, and what that's saying is don't feed them with technical stuff that they're not going to have any interest in, as an example. And stakeholders only need the information they require to make informed decisions. And that's vitally important. They, we only need to feed them with information which is relevant to their specific area of interest. So link information at statement level. So when we talk about information traceability, um, we're talking about traceability at statement level inside the multiple project documents, not at document level. Now, if that, require, if that one statement should need to change, we need to think about what is impacted or touched by that change. So if it changes, what is the impact on the system test? Um, if the system says, if, the, if there's a change that the system says, uh, we're going to be changing the color of the box from red to green, um, what are we actually now testing for? Are we testing for a red box or are we testing for a green box? If no one's told the test engineer they're testing now for a green box, then of course the test will fail because they're looking for a red box. So that's a desperately simple example, but it's given you some of the idea of the value of the traceability. And it's this same traceability we ultimately use to start producing our project specifications and our project, uh, project metrics information, which I'll cover again a bit more. So again, if that system specification requirement changes, are, the question we ask here, are we still compliant with what the stakeholder originally asked for? So again, we've got this explicit link from the system specification that's linked to the actual KPI requirement or the stakeholder requirement that was actually driving this system requirement in the first place. And that actually could be one or many requirements in one or many documents. Well, what is the impact on the subsystem? If the subsystem specification is impacted, then of course it could also have an impact on the uh, subsystem tests. And if we can understand the impact of that change, what is touched by the change, we can start to make more informed decisions about what we need to do or how we can actually um, support that change. Now we're going to the subject of project metrics and completeness. This is a, a crude measure initially, but um, it's worth mentioning anyway. So on the left-hand side, I've got an example here of a document. It's a user document, user requirement document or stakeholder requirements document for user um, interface requirements. And notice I've got each, each individual statement has got a little box around it defining individual statements of intent in that user document. Notice now I've got traceability, explicit traceability actually into the system specification. But notice I've got some of those requirements are traced across to system requirements. So what we need to get out of that is what, which ones of those requirements are at this time being satisfied. And in terms of building project management metrics, I can assess already from here the 35% of these user requirements linked to system requirements. Um, that's interesting, but what's more important here is that 65% of those requirements actually don't link to anything. And that means it's telling me that those requirements have maybe have not been fulfilled or have not been picked up in terms of the system development. 
and out of that, uh, in real time, I can produce a project metric report that discloses that 35% of my requirements have been satisfied, but 65% at this instant in time have not uh, been uh, traced to a system requirement. And that's something we can report on in real time. We also need to think about risk and hazard management. And uh, once you start to build this information into a requirements database, you can actually have um, a document called risk and hazard document or risk document. So risk and hazards can be motivated by requirements from any of those documents we were previously talking about within the project. So linking risks and hazards to risk mitigation information should be an integral part of the project management process. It should be centralized and available and visible to anyone in the project that needs access to that. If we start to link requirements to um, these uh, risk information, we can start thinking about, actively thinking about risk mitigation. But again, this is another element of traceability that can also come out as a, as a report out of the database. So at this point, I will hand over to Andreas, who will now um, put some flesh on this and demonstrate through the tool how we can automate the production of these documents and produce this information um, uh, in real time out of the database. So Andreas, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, well done. Uh, I think I can save some time uh, explaining the block diagram again because you already did in the presentation. Uh, thank you very oh, much good. for that. Um, before, however, before I start the, the demonstration uh, of our solutions uh, with respect to, to uh, the uh, generation of, of uh, product specification documents and uh, key performance indicators, um, uh, I would like to point out that whatever you see in the demonstration are just examples. So as Paul already mentioned, uh, the configurations you may have in your environment, the processes you are using, and uh, also the reports you plan to generate out of the, of the data which is stored in the central database, um, all these uh, things will for sure look different in your scenarios, in your environment, because I have never seen in my 15 years experience uh, of requirements engineering, uh, I have never seen any two customers working exactly the same way. That's almost impossible and uh, the idea or the intention of the demonstration I plan to do now is of course to give you an, an idea how flexible our solutions are to fit any kind of need more or less. So let's uh, get into the demo. Um, I have prepared two different visual requirements projects with two completely different um, configurations. And uh, for those, I have also prepared some, some nice uh, example reports, uh, which I try to explain during this demo. First of all, I would like to start with, a, with an example we, we took from the ISO 26262 environment, um, which, which um, is exactly the, the example we have already seen um, on uh, Paul's slide. So this is exactly the, the same uh, process. Uh, image and as Paul mentioned this is not just a diagram this is not just an image it's really interpreted by the tool that means whatever kind of traceability rules you define in this uh, nice picture uh, those will be applied by the tool itself so a user would be able to create a relationship or a link in between a stakeholder requirement and a subsystem requirement because there's no direct relationship in between those two different types of requirements um, so this is also the way we configure the process in, in visual requirements. We use these kind of diagrams. Um, by the way, uh, these, these boxes are called blocks in, in visual requirements. These boxes typically represent a type of information, not necessarily requirements, of course. You can also have your test cases in, in visual requirements if you like. Um, and uh, if you create the requirements later on, the data sets, the data records, if you, if you like, those can be put into these uh, boxes somehow and um, there are two different important features uh, those blocks have. One is exactly this kind of um, uh, option to define traceability rules uh, on, on top of these boxes and the second um, feature we are using for this kind of um, for, for these kind of blocks is the ability to assign attributes to these types of, uh, of, of uh, requirements. So you may for example define an, uh, your own attribute A assigned to the stakeholder requirements block. At the same time, you may have an attribute B, which is only valid for customer requirements, and you may have an attribute C, which is uh, important for the marketing requirements. If you then create a customer requirement, this customer requirement will be a stake 
holder requirement at the same time, so it would get the attributes A and B, and you can assign values to that requirement. And for a marketing requirement, you would end up in, in attributes A and C, which would be assigned to that uh, particular requirement. And this way, we are very flexible uh, to support almost any kind of process by means of such a, such a um, process diagram. So let's have a look what uh, visual requirements will do out of these blocks here. So if I just focus now on the stakeholder requirements, which can be either custom requirements, marketing requirements, standards and business rules, uh, let's have a look how this will look like in, in visual requirements by means of a view showing the requirements themselves. Uh, therefore, I have configured a predefined view which represents the stakeholder requirements document. And as you can see, the, the, the relationships we have seen in the diagram from the stakeholder requirements to the sub-types, marketing requirements and so forth, uh, they are converted somehow in a kind of hierarchy and I get a document with certain headings, stakeholder requirements and sub-chapters, marketing requirements, business rules and so forth. And uh, the requirements are displayed inside of these chapters. And from such a view, you can immediately create a very easy, uh, in a very easy way, a Word document by just clicking a button, selecting a proper template, maybe your corporate Word template, to generate a nice Word document. Oops, it appears on the second screen, sorry, I have to shift it here. The only thing you need to do in this case, if you, if you run this, um, uh, this Word exp uh, export, you just need to, to update the fields you may have in your Word document, uh, like the table of contents, for example, and then you end up, for example, in such a document. Um, of course, this uh, Word template has been prepared to some extent by means of defining certain paragraph styles to give uh, the document a certain look, look and feel. But as you can see, whatever you have in, in, uh, in visual requirements, it's possible to get this information out again in a very easy way. However, in, uh, um, in, uh, in many cases, or many customers have very specific requirements regarding documents or reports to be generated. Those are addressed using our powerful reporting engine. Um, the next example reports are focusing on uh, hazard analysis. Therefore, I need to close this document and I also have to close this view again to get back to our uh, process diagram. And uh, the reports I plan to show now as examples uh, cover somehow this topic of uh, hazard analysis, which is represented in our process by means of three blocks, starting from hazards that have been derived from certain requirements. For each hazard, I may define a so-called safety goal to mitigate uh, this particular hazard. And for each safety goal, I may later also create certain functional sa safety requirements, which in our case are additional requirements on the subsystem requirements level. So this is the example we are choosing here, and, and for the two reports I plan to show now, uh, we will focus on, on, on this branch of this uh, process. A very easy example because it's just a, a row of three different types of informations. Um, how does it look like here in, in, in Visual? Therefore, I can move over to a different view of the information stored in Visual requirements. This is a view which initially displays a list of identified hazards for our project with certain attributes uh, displayed in columns. And uh, each row, of course, represents one particular piece of information, in, in this case a hazard. Um, Columns do contain the attributes, as mentioned, and um, ISO, uh, ISO. This this uh, hazard analysis, as mentioned, has been has been uh, created based on the information uh, from ISO 26262, which is a safety standard for the automotive industry. And uh, in that um, in that standard, there is a description that uh, hazards needs to be defined. Hazard needs to be evaluated by means of diff three different parameters: exposure, control controllability and severity, and from those three values um, an, an, a so-called ASIL level can be calculated automatically. We will see later how this works, but as you can see I have a list of hazards here with certain um, ASIL levels right now. Um, and as also mentioned, for each hazard you may define 
certain safety goals to um, to mitigate those hazards and those safety goals are linked to the hazards and this is visible in this view uh, by means of expanding those um, those branches here so for example for the first hazard we have defined a safety goal down here uh, for the third hazard we have another safety goal defined and so forth so this is one way how visual requirements can visualize traceability information in a single view in a very easy way and um, Paul was talking about the impact analysis uh, a change of a system requirement may have you would do it in exact the same way using such a traceability view to to uh, to identify the the impacts a certain change of a requirement may have in your in your project but here we have the hazards and the safety goals and uh, from from this kind of view from this information stored in visual here I can create a nice report and the first one I plan to show is the so-called hazard analysis dashboard this is a graphical um, um, output of the distribution of um, of the ASIL levels um, in fact, this is a, a, an interactive report, so that's also an option with our solutions that you can create interactive reports where you can pro uh, provide some additional parameters while you are generating a report. I will just keep the settings as they are, and then I will get, for example, such a nice uh, hazard analysis dashboard indicating that we have four hazards which have been evaluated to ASIL A, uh, two of which uh, two of the hazards uh, have ASIL B, and so forth. And underneath, uh, I will find all the hazards listed again together with their derived safety goals so also the traceability information is in here uh, and those hazards has also been grouped by by the different ASIL levels so that's just a nice example how such a report may look like of course we also include current uh, date and time and also uh, this is the time in Germany to be honest um, and, and also the user who's generated this report and uh, furthermore we can even include backward references into visual requirements into those reports so in case you want to take a closer look in hazard 120 because there's no safety goal associated to that one as you can see from the report I can just click on this guy go back to the view we had before and we will end up in exactly um, in uh, with with this particular hazard uh, highlighted and, and selected in the tool so we can continue working from there if needed uh, let's now um, take a look at the report a closer look uh, you re probably recognize that there's only one um, hazard having having been evaluated to QM and two have been evaluated to ASIL level D uh, to prove that we produce these kind of re reports in real time I will now update some of the information in Visure especially the one which is uh, evaluated to QM I will change the values here uh, to change the, the ASIL level therefore I have to check out that particular hazard uh, that's the way Visure works whenever you want to change some 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 information in the tool some record some some single requirement you need to check out that requirement then it's locked for you and you can start modifying it and after you have done all the modifications you can uh, you you have to check in the requirement again to allow other users doing further modifications if needed uh, you, while you're doing checkout and check-in you are also creating a new version of that particular item so you have an entire version history of all the changes you have done to each single requirement to each single hazard to each single test case let's now change the values here for example I will uh, change the exposure uh, those values by the way have been also derived from the ISO 26262 I don't really remember the, their meanings in detail but if you want to check those values E1 to E4 just read the standard and uh, I hope you will find it somewhere <laughs> so let's change uh, the, the exposure from E2 to E4 for example then as you can see the ASIL level turns to ASIL A and the other one I would like to change is maybe this guy here which is currently ASIL level D uh, I check out that one I maybe I change the controllability in this case to C1 and then this particular hazard uh, turns to ASIL level B. Now we can create the same report again before I would like to close that one. Uh, let's create the same report again and check whether the, the information in the report has been updated properly. I hope so. I will use the same settings again and here you go. As you can see there's no um, hazard anymore with QM and only one is, uh, is left with ASIL level D as we have 
uh, seen in, in visual requirements already. So this is real life data from our prod product. Um, the second example I would like uh, to show uh, now is uh, a fairly simple coverage report for the safety goals. Uh, the report will tell us which of the safety goals have already been addressed by proper functional safety requirements. Of course, we can see this information in visual requirements right away using another traceability view, which is this guy here. So this shows traceability from safety goals down to the functional safety requirements. But unfortunately, there is no plus sign here, so it seems there is no functional requirement, uh, functional safety requirement uh, defined as of now. That's, of course, not very good. Um, of course, we can also visualize this kind of information in a kind of safety goals coverage analysis uh, document, which I want to, dem uh, want to generate now. It's once again, it's a single click. In this case, it's not an interactive report, so there's no, there are no additional parameters for that particular report. Uh, and in this case, you will get this nice output indicating that we have six safety goals. All of them are red. All of them are uncovered. So this is probably a nightmare for management to see that nothing has been done on these safety goals so far. On the second page, by the way, we also provide some figures. So the total number of safety goals, for example, the number of safety goals that have been covered, and so forth. And as you can see, there's even a nice, nice um, uh, chart here indicating we have a big, big problem here because all our safety goals have not yet been covered in our project. So uh, we need to fix that right away. So I will just create a new functional safety requirement based on a, um, on a safety goal. Um, so the easiest way to create new requirements or better items in visual requirements is by using so-called item templates. In our example, an item template is defined for the creation of a functional safety requirement, ensuring that the new requirement gets linked to the selected safety goal. So the only thing I do, I select the safety goal, I click this nice button to create a new requirement in, in our solution, and then you get a, sel uh, a selection, a list of available templates. In case you select a safety goal, there's only one template available for the user because of the selection, uh, which is the creation of a functional safety requirement. And as you can see here, this new requirement I'm about to create will be linked immediately to the selected safety goal. So in this case, you can even create the traceability more or less automatically just by adding a new requirement. Um, unfortunately, I'm not very creative regarding the content of such requirements. A new functional safety requirement. And this is the description. The description in Visual uh, contains, of course, the, the requirement itself in more detail, ideally. And then I just click OK, and I get the new functional safety requirement it appears uh, right below the, the safety goal, meaning that the safety goal and the uh, functional safety requirement have been linked by the tool. You may uh, do the same once again. To save some time, I will just type some stupid characters here. And perhaps uh, you are a lucky guy and uh, you can link the same functional safety requirement to some of the other safety goals. This is, of course, something we can do also, but just right-clicking one requirement, select start relationship, and then we can create those links by selecting the other safety goals. Once again, we need to do right click, set relationship, then we get this kind of summary indicating that we want to link a functional safety requirement to three different safety goals. And down here, uh, we, 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 we can choose the uh, link type to be used for those links. We have seen in the diagram before that we have different types of, of links. And um, in this case, there is only one choice because um, because of the diagram again. Because if, if you remember in the diagram, we just had one arrow and there was just one uh, type of relationship available for, 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 for the links in between safety goals and uh, functional safety requirements. So this information is, is taken from the diagram directly. So after I have created those links, uh, we may end up in something like that. Uh, from a traceability perspective, and maybe you have someone uh, uh, 
which is not a user of the requirements management tool itself. He may want to have this visualized in a different way by means of such a kind of report. So I will just generate the same report as we have had before just once again. And now we hopefully will see the update. This looks much better. We now have some safety goals in green, which means we have addressed them somehow. Of course, uh, it depends on the content whether they have been addressed properly, but at least I can say, hey, we, we, have, we have thought about it. We have created a functional safety requirement against this particular safety goal. We have even created two different functional safety requirements to, to address this safety goal and so forth, but they still, there are still two uncovered safety goals, so there's still some work to do. And of course, also the diagrams and the numbers here are properly updated. Very, very easy. Okay, that was uh, what I would like to show in this um, first project structure. Uh, now I would like to show you some other real-life report examples from a customer of my, uh, mine here in Germany. Of course, I cannot share their data, that's clear, but uh, I have replaced some, some of their data by dummy data and I have also simplified the, the configuration because they really have a quite impressive and, and quite complex configuration uh, in place. So I tried to simplify this configuration uh, for this uh, demo. In order to, to show that, I just need to switch to the other project. which is this project here, Documents with Subtypes. And before I can show you the reports, I have to explain again a little bit the, the project configuration because otherwise it's difficult to understand how those reports uh, could be generated and why they look like they, they look. Um, so for, um, for this customer, or this customer uh, requested us uh, that we should, that they were, and uh, they also had some, some uh, stronger requirements regarding traceability. They told us, hey, we only want to create traceability in between requirements. We do not allow users, we do not want to allow users creating traceability in between headers or informational text. Uh, items. And uh, another um, uh, requirement we got was uh, that they would like to have attributes, of course, for their requirements, but only for the requirements, not for the headers or not for the informational text. And therefore, we, we ended up in this kind of co configuration. Um, each specification or each document they, they would like to have in visual requirements is represented by one block. The CRS is the customer requirement specification, the SRS is the system requirement specification, hardware requirement specification down here, and guess what, this is the software requirement specification, left branch of the B model. Um, but underneath each of the document blocks, I will find one block representing the requirements of that document, another block representing headers of that document, and another block representing text blocks, so informational text um, uh, can be put here. Regarding traceability, as mentioned, traceability has been defined only for, um, for requirements, so in this case we have different types of traces. I forgot to mention that uh, what I've shown before, that was uh, the requirement specifications. Apart from those requirement specifications, the customer is also using design documents and test specifications. The setup for those is pretty much the same, they just have different names. And uh, the traceability, for the traceability, they have defined different types of traces. So the traces in between requirements from one abstraction level to another abstraction level uh, in the V model, they call these traces traced. Then they also have the, uh, another type of, of trace which is called allocated or allocation link. They use this kind of trace uh, whenever they create a, a link in between a design document and the requirement specification on the same abstraction level. So in this case we have a um, system requirement specification and a system design specification and if you have a certain uh, design object in the system design specification that might be linked to system requirement specification by means of, the, of, of a link of type allocated. And then there's a third one which is important for this uh, demo, which is the verification type of link, which we have, of course, in between the requirements and the test specifications. They call their test cases not test cases, they call them tasks for whatever reason. Uh, the interesting part here is they do not use uh, one uh, test specification per abstraction level. Instead, they 
told us that they have different types of tests and those different types of tests are, are managed in different test specifications but those tests might be linked to all the requirements without uh, relation to their uh, abstraction level. So this is more or less the example which is the base for the for the two reports I, I would like to show in this example. Um, as you have seen from the various diagrams, this configuration is fairly complex and it contains different types of coverages. System requirement from the SRS might be covered by more detailed hardware or software requirements. The same system requirement may also be covered by a design element and of course it should also be covered by a proper test case. Um, let's now have a look how this may look like in, in how this customer is working in, in uh, visual requirements. So they typically prefer working in this document-like way. That's why we have this kind of document-like representation where you can see the chapter structure of the document uh, and inside the text, uh, the, the chapter structure you will find those requirements and only the requirements as you can see they have those attributes, those additional attributes. And now of course they also requested to, to get a nice document out of uh, these kind of, of uh, out of this kind of setup, of course, we were able to do so. So, in fact, they gave us a word document how it looks like and uh, how it, how they have written their word documents in the past. And what we did, we just produced a certain report which looks exactly the same. And they were absolutely happy to see that even if they use visual requirements, they can still have the same word documents out of the system as they have have been using in the past. Um, yeah, this way, uh, in this case, we, we generate Word documents with a, an additional user interface where users are able to select the document to be generated and the one I would like to choose now is uh, the CRS. So maybe before generating the report, let's have a look at the CRS document. Um, and now we can scroll a little bit down and we have a kind of revision history table in here as an information and text object and we have some additional attributes. You can find some nice images in here and so forth. And now if we would like to create a document from this uh, information, I can select CRS here to be generated. And then I, pr I have some, some additional options here, uh, one which is to open the generated document right away. And the other one is whether I would like to have a simplified report or, so to say, the full report. First, I will, would like to generate the full report. And, of course, this may take a few seconds. Uh, while waiting for the result, uh, I may remind you that you can of course post any questions or feedback uh, in the in the um, go to meeting panel so feel free to to ask your questions whenever you, they came to your mind generating word documents typically takes a bit more time uh, because of word because what we do of course here is we generate a word document so that we populate the the word document with a lot of data in a in a in a quite fast way. Uh, word is not intended to be to, to be used that way. Usually Word is a product which you use to manually type in some text. Of course we do not manually type in the text. We push all the text into the document which which is something which uh, Word doesn't really do in a good way. However, this might be the output so in this case I'm, I'm, I'm of course using a kind of corporate Word template which which has some introductional text and uh, then hopefully also a kind of table of contents which is fully fully uh, printed already and then down here I will find uh, the document as I would expect it uh, with chapter structure in this case also the ID of the info, uh, of the objects in, in Visual and even more if you have a requirement I also get more details about that requirement by means of, of uh, the list of attributes and their values and also the traceability information is in here so you can even see that for example um, this requirement number 229 here with night uh, traffic a nice traffic light um, this is obviously traced down to a system requirement with number A000483 so even the traceability information is in that document Let's have a look now in the second variant because that was also a request from that customer that they wanted to be able to generate two different variants or even more different variants of the same document. For the demo I have just chosen um, a second option which is the simplified report which is more or less the same, the exact same document uh, without those tables containing the attribute information because the customer told us, hey, we need to have the exact same document for our customer, 
we want to send this document to the customer, but of course the customer should not get all the details about the the evaluations we did internally on those requirements by means of the, the um, priority or the status and stuff like that. And therefore we decided to have this variant of the same document which contains the exact same information without those attribute tables and without the traceability information. So it's fairly simple. Once it is ready, here you go. So this is the exact same document as mentioned, the same template has been used, of course the same table of contents, the page numbers are different. <laughs> and down here we have the same uh, information, the same requirements without the tables. Very easy, so we can have different variants, we can have different layouts, uh, we can generate several different kinds of documents out of the data stored in visual requirements. The second example I would like to show is about the coverage. We have seen in the block diagram that this quite complex setup comes with different types of coverages. So as mentioned, the requirement might be covered by a test, a requirement might be covered by design, and the requirement might be covered by, uh, by more detailed requirements one level down. And uh, here we also got a request to produce a kind of overview report about these kind of coverages, and this has also been solved in two ways in this case, uh, therefore I need to create a trace report. Um, and the two different ways we have chosen here is one report that will be generated now is a Word document like the one we have seen before, of course with different layout, but in fact it's also a Word document containing all the detailed details about the traceability for each of the requirement documents. And the other report we generate at the same time is a web-based report which the customer put into the intranet in order to allow their management to have a kind of summary, more like a dashboard-like like view on the coverages. Uh, therefore, I have to execute this report not right now. So in this case, we will generate two types of reports. First, the Word document. Once the Word document is ready, we will take a closer look at it and the second one will be a web page directly put on the intranet. Of course, in my case here, the intranet is my local PC, so I will just open um, the web browser. That's maybe something I can do in the meantime. This is my uh, intranet here on local host. As you can see, there is a nice visual dashboard available here, powered by our re reporting engine, but currently it's still empty because I'm still producing the web page. Give me please some seconds. Here we go. So the Word document is ready. So this is the traceability report I just have created from the data. Once again, a quite impressive table of contents because we have many chapters and if I take a closer look in here, there's some, some, uh, some introductory um, information which is more or less hard-coded. Um, in the second chapter I can find for example an information like the project name. So you may want to use the exact same report for different projects and then you just need to replace the project name. This is done of course automatically by the reporting engine. Also you have some kind of date and time information in here and then I've, I have uh, printed a traceability summary for each single requirement specification indicating that this this particular requirement, uh, requirement specification is covered by other documents and then I get some, some numbers. So for example, the CRS contains uh, 14 requirements, um, none of which has been covered in design but nine of which has been covered by more detailed requirements, system requirements in this case, and three of the 14 uh, requirements have been covered by a certain test case. And I also have the information that five requirements have, are still uncovered and so forth. In this case, of, uh, this kind of information is uh, repeated for each single requirement specification. And of course, for each single requirement specification, I can find more details in a later chapter, which I can show immediately by just following a link which I have inside the document. And here I can find all the details for the downstream coverage of, of the customer requirement specification. As an example, once again, the same table as we had in the beginning. And then I get a pr printout of all the uncovered requirements. And after that, I get a printout of all the traces that has been established from the customer requirement specification to the system requirement specification. 
and later on to all the other documents, always in the same way. So it's a full traceability document, if you like, indicating we all the requirements. Three minutes. With all. Yes, yes, we have three minutes left. I'm almost, I'm almost done. Thank you for the for yeah. the information. So that's one one report with all the details, and then we have uh, remember we have the nice dashboard here, which has been produced hopefully now. Yes, it has been produced, so I can just refresh the page, and I get this nice report showing the same information in a more management oriented way so I also have the the numbers here for each document I get some nice pie charts for the different types of coverages so for example for the CRS there's only a coverage by means of more detailed requirements trace down coverage by refining those requirements uh, we also have the verification coverage in here and the overall coverage there is no uh, design coverage in this case because uh, this customer there's no design document on that on, on that level of requirements but if you take a look further down for the SRS uh, we also have design coverage as there is also a system design specification and so forth and this kind of information is quite valuable we also have some some figures about orphans which means requirements that are not linked to any customer requirement so why do we have those requirements that would be the question here and there's also a printout for uncovered requirements here in the system requirement specification so in case you want to work on them you can just click the hyperlink here and you are back in our in our tool and you can continue working on that system requirement that was my demo more or less in Thank time you, Andreas. okay sure get can you put me back onto the final slide and yes of course we'll wrap up. i will do give me a second yeah, you can continue. You should still have presenter rights and mouse control. Okay. So um, very quickly, um, while I'm uh, closing up, if you have any questions, then by all means type your questions into the question panel. Um, but hopefully we've shown here um, um, how we can gain business benefit from centralizing and capturing project stakeholder requirements in one place. If I can... Uh, I've got some, yes, okay. Um, we've demonstrated how to quickly and simply get stakeholder requirements out of your shared uh, project repository. Um, and um, we have produced um, ad hoc real-time project status and metrics reports out of the database. There are many instances where a project engineer is tasked with producing a report or metrics for internal peer or management review. This generally involves the tedium of extracting the relevant information from various sources, organizing it, and then arranging it for a professionally appealing production of a document. Usually, by the time the document reaches its target audience, however, there are some inconsistencies, out-of-date or incorrect information contained within it. The problem often stems from a gap between the engineering data and the production of the document. This gap can be eliminated with visual requirements. So really we're talking about producing this document in real time as part of the ongoing project activity. So there are numerous engineering reports which Visual Requirements produces at any time during the requirements analysis and functional design activity or the functional allocation process. Um, so that's with the engineering data, the metrics, the status information about the project. Now if we look at the uh, delivery of uh, contracting your, your contract deliverables, your formatted documents, like the one that uh, Andreas just shown there. So during the life cycle of most systems, there is an ongoing need to produce specification documents to satisfy the needs of the various customers, subcontractors, stakeholders, and other organizations participating in the system development process. All too often, these activities, since they usually carry the label deliverable and hence generate revenue, take precedence over the engineering of the system. Since staffing is usually fixed for most contracts, this means that valuable and expensive engineering talent is consumed producing paper. So visual requirements effectively eliminates this waste by providing easily modified templates and functions for automated report and specification production. And out of this, uh, from customer feedback on various projects, Certainly on the ad hoc engineering reports, they've identified uh, savings of time and cost of about 20%. In terms of producing those final deliverable customer specifications fully formatted, that actually represented savings of up to 40%.
So with that, that closes um, really the session. Um, if we, if there, there, are, there are no questions have come in, um, clearly if you've got any questions, then please feel free to come back to us um, through your local representative. Certainly in the U.S., as uh, Fernando will take questions, but feel free to make contact with us. Now we will be sending out a um, a, a um, video of this presentation, so you can view it again at your leisure or share it with your colleagues. Um, but it looks like there were no further questions. May, may, I, add, may, may I add a final comment? Uh, you mentioned fully automated report generation. We have not really seen this in the demo because I have always triggered the report generation from within Visual. This is not a must, of course. The, uh, the customer here in Germany, uh, the, the web page report I have shown at the end, in fact, is, is generated in, uh, uh, in batch mode by means of a scheduled process in the background. So you don't see anything. Thank you very, very much for your time. I know your time is precious and uh, you spent an hour with us, so uh, I hope you found the, the session of value and that we've demonstrated our ability to automate some of the ability to produce reports.